another episode of The Road the Stay. This is it. Are we on? Are we like there? I think we're on. Thing we're doing? I think we don't need headphones either because we're just talking to each other. I just, it feels awkward. I know. It's weird. It feels naked. Um, so we had this conversation uh, a few days ago with our guest on this week's episode of The Road the Stage. Yes. Guess that is going to be playing at Bose very soon. And uh, have, man, they've got like some pretty heavy shows behind them are like these these guys have seen it where do you are, sorry is this where you walk out grab my phone god damn it <laughs> is this it pete has no idea what the fuck he's talking about I don't i'm out of here <laughs> sorry i just threw ryan into a complete tizzy with yelling sorry um, ryan yelling into a mic like a fucking amateur the amateur hour all right so we had a guest on uh this day's episode of the road the stage and i just want to make sure my details are correct because there are so many goddamn shows I'm having a hard April time. April 15th. Good job, dude. Right? April 15th. Am I right? April 15th at Bose Royal Boom. Canoe with Zune. And that tour is stretching across most of the country, if I'm not mistaken. I, it's pretty extensive. I believe Ontario through, pretty through extensive. BC. Yeah. Um, I've never seen Royal Canoe. I've heard nothing but absolutely wanted to, remarkable things. I swear. Do you remember? I, they sent us a cassette. No, I don't. Do no, you remember I don't, that? No, I don't remember that. Pos- I got it. I meant to look for it before this episode, but we'll have to ask Matt Peters, our guest today from Royal Canoe, when he uh, shows up. There's in a Bose, lot, a lot of things, a lot of things to uh, to get to on the episode. Uh, let's get to our uh, our friends. Our friends, we have friends. Uh, not trying to brag, but no. uh, it's good to have friends. Like I th- they legit. Like I think it's a legit friendship. Yeah, you guys hang out. You play games together. You play Catan. spin records. Yeah, yeah, spin records. Yeah, spoon. They're like fuck, man. Yeah, we heard it. <laughs> uh, Sawback Brewing company they do vinyl nights every thursday night cool here in red deer uh go services inc and bose barn stage and of course our home communal creative studios here in red deer alberta producers ryan and riley kicking ass and this is episode 52 two which is like that's 52 weeks that's an episode a week 52 weeks all right right yes i remember april 17th was that april 14th why how is this i'm the this doesn't add up I know it is year. weird. But, um, how does there's 52 weeks in a year? Are you sure about I'm that? Sure. Pretty you sure it's not pretty 50? sure it's 52. I do have a Didsbury High School. How many goddamn weeks in a year? 52. It doesn't add up. Anyways, so how we're not the mathematicians. April 14th. Our guest is was the April 14th is is the first episode with Tyler Bancroft from Said the Whale. Let's just talk to Matt. Hey Matt, how's it going, man? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Not too bad. I'm Patrick Bateman. This is Peter Michaels. How you doing, Matt? Patrick, Peter. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah, you too, man. Uh, where where are we right now? You're I just like in your setup, your fun yeah. room at home, or what? Yeah, this, this is our uh, this is the Royal Canoe rehearsal space, which is looks pretty grimy, and uh, you know, but this is where this is where we just were yesterday rehearsing. So uh, it's like on the 11th floor, in like this kind of attic area on in this office space where they like the, the elevator stop on the 10th floor and then <laughs> the musicians have to walk up to the <laughs> luxury tree know where to put us yeah. um it doesn't look grimy at all it looks in, in fact quite you know bright. what i what i actually love like people spend so much money on lighting yeah but just a couple of strands of christmas lights that's all you need you're good to go that's the trick that's the trick <laughs> So you're just, you know, you're you're not too far off from the beginning of your tour. Um, you're, you're, yeah. you're rehearsing. I'm curious, for a band that has so much going on, uh, so much brain power going into your, your music, how, what do rehearsals look like? Oh, my God. I, I, I hate to say this, but they're like, there are definitely spreadsheets involved. I'm not going to lie. I had a feeling. <laughs> I had a feeling. So, like, do any of you come from, uh, like, uh, big band or orchestra backgrounds? Not really. I mean, like a few of us took piano lessons and choir in school. And so we have that background of like n- having some music theory knowledge. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, nothing, nothing much more extreme than, than that. No experience in, in organizing a very large group of, of musicians. <laughs> no, but you know, honestly, like we've, I feel like the, the on the job aspect sort of took care of all of that. Maybe lack of experience at the beginning of, you know, we we started out when we were recording our music, not really thinking at all, and we still we still subscribe to this completely. We don't really think about how we're going to pull it off. We and we don't think about how many hands and feet we have. We just sort of make the songs and just kind of trust that amongst the various members, and then also 
with the, uh, you know, the technology that we have that we can, we'll be able to figure it out some way. And uh, we've kind of stuck to the idea of not having laptops really be involved. And so we use a variety of samplers and we have lots of sense. And, you know, usually like there's often a little thing here or there that we have to, we have to uh, let go of. But for the most part, I'm always surprised at how we just kind of, it just sort of figures itself out. So yeah. that, after like spreadsheeting and rehearsing. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got one of those <laughs> things that you've had to let it slide. Does it bug you while you're on tour? Do you guys get together afterwards? Like, ah, oh, man, I really wish we had a way to fit that part in. Or is it just becomes a new monster? It just becomes its own thing. It, it's interesting. Like I, I, feel, I find like the live versions, they always take on a life of their own um, compared to the record. And, you, you know, just we we're rehearsing a song from the new album yesterday and, uh, and Michael suddenly had this idea for like a couple extra like cymbal and kick shots. And I think honestly, what happens is the exact opposite thing, which is that the live version takes on a life of its own. You incorporate all of these new elements because you've had all this time to play it. You're getting you're reacting to to the crowd and to your own feelings of playing the music. And then what usually happens is you you regret not including those things on the recording. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you, like would you if you if you were to uh sit on one side of studio versus live recordings in your own listening habits not necessarily royal canoe but with other bands are there days you prefer listening to live recordings over the studio studio product i think i usually be i think i usually just in, enjoy the studio i don't know maybe that's not a popular thing to say but like i also do a lot of producing mm -hmm. and engineering and songwriting and stuff and so often when you're in that position you'll go and see a band perform that you've worked with and you're like oh but we did that one thing why aren't you doing that one thing it is it's it's definitely like your own ego being like hey that was a decision we made what's up but at the same time you can't kind of help yourself I just like you have a vision in your head this imprint of like what it should be and and then like we were talking about with royal canoe you end up the you know, the, you start playing it live and then that starts to morph this idea of what the song is in your head. And so everyone has, everyone who's involved in the creative process uh, or in the interpretation is going to have, you know, a fingerprint on that. And they're going to feel really, they're going to feel really connected to, to the version that they affect, you know, it's just mm -hmm. the way it is. It's just natural. And so I feel like, but yeah, at the end of the day, I feel like for myself, I'm much more of a, uh, I'm much more of a studio version kind of person, except for Royal Canoe, <laughs> of course. Um, so uh, back to the rehearsals, you've got spreadsheets. Obviously, it sounds like you've you've set yourselves up for success in terms of organization and, and not really wasting any rehearsal time. Um, how does that carry over when you're actually on tour? Is there any organization on stage? Anything you have to rely on? Oh, man, like because they're like right now there's five of us, but especially when there were six, but like just finding space on the stage is often <laughs> such a hard thing. I remember like our first South by Southwest, um, we played in, you know, like the requisite South by Southwest venue off of sixth street somewhere that was somehow packed. And, you know, you're kind of off in a corner, like a, a, an area of the bar that like used to be like their cooler or something, you yeah. know, this is just the nature of, of how that festival goes. And I remember Matt Schellenberg, the keyboard player, was literally like had to almost like hold his like little mixing board that he had that he plugged his stuff into. Like while he was playing, he was like kind of balancing it on his knee at one point in the set because there was so little space. And you just it was like a little Tetris game of trying to figure out like how do we get everything on stage? And I feel like that that like that's maybe like the worst version of it. But I feel like over the years, like that's like really never changed. And oddly, like no matter how big the stage gets like if you had opportunity we've had some opportunities to play on larger stages you're still sort of like individually being like can you move that monitor over just like four inches like to your <laughs> bad mates like you're always you're always kind of fighting for your turf and so I, I feel like in terms of like the organizational stuff on one hand we have like how are we going to fit on the stage and then the other hand there's all the just the logistics that go into tour you know like someone recently i can't remember the band's name but it's um Wednesday, mm. this band, I don't know if you guys saw this tweet that came out. No, I don't think ago, so. This band named Wednesday, and they tweeted like sort of a real talk uh, 
uh, iPhone screenshot of, of their expenses for this past tour that they were just on. And, uh, and then I think, you know, there's a big reaction online for that. Like on one hand, people were like, what if, I thought you guys were DIY. Why do you stay in hotels? You know? And then on the other hand, there's a lot of musicians who are so sympathetic because they realize what goes in to trying to make these tours happen. And obviously if you're in the States, it's, it's on a completely other level, but um, you know, here in Canada, we have a lot of extra supports that they don't have, but that's my way of saying that like the organizational stuff that goes into just running a business also that you, you, you know, it's the least sexy thing of, of rock and roll, but yeah. there you, there you are, uh, you know, driving from Red Deer to Calgary, like inputting into your spreadsheet, the twenty six thirty five dollars of gas that you, uh, you just bought in Airdrie or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's just that's just a huge part of of being on the road so as you guys are getting ready to take off obviously gas prices uh have skyrocketed across the country so how many conversations have been had about geez how do we make this work well yeah you know honestly like we had to we had like we have like a number that we have in uh in in mind that like this is how much it costs for our band to be on the road and that number like we had to just increase it by 20 percent really You just had to like, this is like the new reality. And honestly, like gas prices are one thing, but like also just since we've toured and I don't know, I'm not sure if you guys, if if I mentioned this earlier, but this is actually our first tour in two and a half years. And so in that span of time, like inflation is just crazy. And like often it's like this slow snail's pace and you don't really realize it. Like one, you don't really like from day to day, you're, you're going from like, you know, maybe you spent $12 on a cocktail and then suddenly at 16, you don't even realize it or something, you know, yeah. for the bougie shit. But like in terms of, in terms of like having like your, a really important aspect of your life be kind of turned off like two and a half years ago and then now turned back on, you can really, like, I can really notice those things now. Like I think gas will be interesting, hotels, all that stuff is just uh it's it's kind of a unique position of of being able to really see like oh man there's been a there's been a marked increase in noticeable difference yeah yeah is there imagine slamming a band for staying in a fucking hotel oh yeah that what a fun life that you should be be on the floor uh yeah i thought you're i thought you're a diy man what floor are you sleeping (laughs) on what stranger's floor um i know anytime we we do a trip my wife tries really hard to keep us on budget and we have everything all set out and i'm the guy that's like ah you know let's just splurge on this did who is there a member of the band that is like ah you know it's okay we can just splurge a little bit over here or does everybody stay on the the tight and narrow i think we're pretty good but i mean like i i feel like we're 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 just like we're all led by by whatever the 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 wherever the momentum's taking us so like you know if it's late night and we want to like splurge on food i feel like it just takes one person to be like yeah but why don't we just do this and everyone's like yeah let's do it <laughs> i feel like and then when someone's being responsible like i feel like everyone just their guilt mechanism yeah just immediately like you don't want to be the one person who's like arguing to like you know i don't know go to some expensive restaurant if no one else wants to but yeah i think we we've got pretty good you know and, and like that's an interesting thing about being on the road for having been doing this with Royal Canoe for, for over 10 years is that you sort of develop your rhythms and your dynamic in the band. And, uh, and I feel like you start to really, you can kind of start to work as a machine. Like everyone knows their place, you know, like everyone knows their role, like, which is, it's such an interesting part of group dynamics is how like people, people will be like, my role here is to sort of like be the butt end to the joke or my role here is to, is to like balance everything out. So if this person says we should do this, I have to say that we're doing this. And you, you like, you really pick that stuff. It's impossible not to sort of function in that manner in like a group of five or six or seven people. Um, It's just the only way to kind of like keep the ship balancing. Um, speaking of tour and foods, it's been two and a half years since you guys hit the road. Are there any places on the road that you, you guys are already like, okay, we're, we're going there in this city. It's oh, been man. far too long. You know, I haven't actually thought that far ahead to be honest, but oh, I know nice. that that will be happening. Actually, no, that's not true. There's a, a place, uh, one of Brendan's, uh, bass player, Brendan, his, his, uh, one of his friends from here has actually opened up a, 
a restaurant just outside of Thunder Bay. And so we're playing Thunder Bay and we've kind of all decided that we're going to go to this awesome diner the day after the show. And so I'm sure there'll be like those things that'll keep coming up and uh, there'll be restaurants that we, that we'll remember. Like I, to be honest, like my memory for those sorts of things, is just not the same as some of the other guys. Like they'll suddenly reference some restaurant and be like, Oh yeah. Like how did I forget about that? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, and then I'm like, Oh yeah, I had like that one piece of food that was like the best thing ever, but somehow eight years later, I can't even recall it. So <laughs> there'll be a, there'll be a lot of that. I'm sure on this tour, like food is, is an important pleasure source when you're in the middle of, you know, nowhere or when you're anywhere, really just, just having that, that consistency of being able to like expect that little joy burst is mm-hmm. going to be really fun. Uh, so speaking of that, April 15th is your show at Bose. Um, I, I just want to say thank you for bringing Zune at West. That's very exciting for us. Oh yeah. Zune's awesome. We played shows with them. Uh, in i think that would have been the two and a half year tour maybe three years um we played some shows and just such an incredible band and we you know when we knew we were going on this on this uh tour they were definitely one of the first bands that we uh that we like you know called up and asked if they wanted to join us that's sweet yeah we had dan on the show about a month ago i want to say maybe a bit over that right around there yeah such such a solid dude yeah yeah it was a great great talk um and like i really connect with that record because uh we both appreciate my bloody valentine so it was uh yeah that's uh, great definitely an important record to me in in the last year um and and so this tour is for sidelining your record which came out in 2021 right Uh, i think 20 yes early 2021 you're right january but you also just put out the vault yeah so what like the tour is the (laughs) sidelining tour are you you put out this this vault this b-sides album right is that that fair to say yeah it's exactly that is exactly what it is yeah Yeah, it's like it just means the show is twice as long because there's two albums yeah yeah Yeah. sorry (laughs) sorry bar owner owners yeah um yeah it's it's we you know we didn't get a chance to go on a proper tour because of obvious reasons in putting it out in early last year and so as we were gearing up for this tour, we had always had this idea of trying to, um, to do something with these songs that just didn't make the cut. Cause you always have those songs on the album where you're like, okay, we love this song, but it just doesn't belong here. Yeah. And then sometimes you can fit it in as a single or, or something, but often it just doesn't make it. And, uh, it was great to, to, you know, we had this idea that let's, let's try to, let's try to collect those songs and just see like, is there an album here? Do we want to finish some of these? And so it became a nice little creative project. That just, I think it was in October, November of this past year where we got to go into a studio and finish, we finished up about five of the songs that were like half finished, like ideas that we thought were so solid that we never finished them. And then five songs were, were completely mastered or the other half of the record. And so, yeah, it just, it felt like it was kind of a spur of the moment thing where we didn't try not to overthink, it and just you we're like hey i'm i bet people will appreciate this and we'll appreciate it because it's these little fragments these little babies that you that you like sort of half birthed in some way and they're just they never got finished and it was it felt great to finally complete those and get to share them with everybody well it's really cool and uh uh i think the the first thing on the top of my mind with the vault specifically is that uh dill the giant song mm-hmm um yeah who we're... i'm fairly unfamiliar with is there anything you can tell us about dill the giant because i got a feeling we we need to start paying attention yeah oh man he's he's such a solid mc he um winnipeg he was... based right winnipeg based yeah. yeah he's also with this group called three pete who we did uh like a pretty much a whole album of songs with it was like an ep about a year mid 2021 as well i think we released it okay maybe earlier hard for me to to get the order of things sometimes especially over the last two and a half years <laughs> but at some point in the last two years we put out this album with 3p and we called it rc3po and uh yeah it was just fun we got to we got to work and make like a rap album which we've always wanted to do and they were so great and the whole creative process was really easy and um so we always loved his his style and and so when we drop this uh single we were preparing we knew we wanted a verse in it and so we asked him and he came by the studio and a couple hours later you know we had the the song all finished very cool yeah it's it's really really sweet i've listened to it many times in the last week 
Awesome. Many times. It's the one thing with doing this podcast it's really opened my eyes to, as well as just the Winnipeg music community, oh because I didn't really know how uh, vast it was. And we've had Boy Half Golden, Sweet Half, Alibi, Half of our Zune. show seems to be very, yeah, very uh, inspired by Winnipeg or Manitoba. Yeah. And I, 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 everyone always says that, and I, I'm, I always feel proud to, to be a Winnipegger. And yeah, it's true. I mean, there's just a ton of artists here, and I don't know, you know, everyone's asked me over the years why that is, but I don't know if it's anything specific. But there, it just seems to be a place that, like, it inspires you in some weird way. Maybe because of itself, in spite of itself. I don't know. There's a constant battle here of, of like staying, leaving loving hating and you know in the midst of all of those forces i think you kind of it kind of awakens some of your your uh just inspiration have you ever left winnipeg i was just gonna say it seems a testament to winnipeg because most people see like <laughs> most people seem to stay yeah um i mean i've left for stretches that's for sure okay i mean i one of the crazy things about having toured like honestly since i was about 22 21 i've been on the road this last two and a half year stretch is the longest in my life. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's like, honestly, I've been almost 20 years or yeah, almost 20 years of being on the road a couple months a year, sometimes more. Um, and so I felt like I've always had that like break from being home and just feeling like I'm, you know, just having a, an opportunity to travel is just so huge. And so coming I feel like a lot of Winnipeggers do that, whether they're like tree planting or they're musicians or they just love traveling. It's a great home base. It's right in the middle of the country that like, if you get away enough, maybe like from any place it's you can justify. And you can also like, it's okay to, to stay there because you're getting opportunities elsewhere and you're, and you're, and you're exploring the rest of the world. And so for me, that's been a huge part of, of just still being here. And I mean, it's my home. It's where my family lives, but, I don't know about what happens in the future. I I can't like, I I always want to leave as I think a lot of Winnipeggers do is you sort of like leave the the door open, but you know, there you are just kind of staring at the threshold 20 years later and you're still here. So who knows? There you go. But never, and and never any desire to like, we we hear so many music, you got to get to Toronto, like in this country, you have to get to Toronto or Montreal, Yeah, but you've never, to be honest, if I, if I left, I would probably go to the states yeah i think okay no offense to toronto or montreal but i've spent like having done this for 20 years i can tell you that i've definitely spent my share of time in toronto probably yeah. more than any other city it's great uh, you know i have so many friends industry friends and just amazing people live there um but i think so but i think if i was going to make a move it would be to somewhere just it would be more of a move yeah i think yeah and the weather's just not nicer enough to justify it as well <laughs> um so we're going don't through... tell anyone in toronto i said that <laughs> okay no one no one no one hopefully we don't have any listeners over there um so we talked we touched on sidelining the vault uh are any of those vault tracks gonna make it to your live show there we are definitely gonna play at least one song okay. um we've been rehearsing it's it's yeah that that's extra weird because it's so it's so like it's like new slash old yeah like often like we'll be working on a like the saw that we're playing i think the session when i opened it it's called april time and i think when i uh when we started working on it again i would go in and like be like so when did this session like when did it start because you can just look at your file created by date and uh that song started i think in 2011 wow i believe and so, you know, that there's just these these relics from the past. And so like often I'm I've really pride myself on like if I if I like make a keyboard sound or I'm recording and I try to write down like, okay, this was program seventy six, bank two or something. Because if you don't do that, it's gone. Ten years later you you can't find anything or whatever and you're just, it just can be so frustrating. But all of my sounds had changed. Everything that I'd written down has completely changed over the years. It was completely ho- not helpful at all um so yeah now we're going back and you're and you're learning to play these songs that like were never fully finished and you're and so we're we kind of went back into the studio and like in some cases like had to sing verse two so like in my in verse one is like 30 year old matt and verse two is like 40 year old matt 
So it's like listening back to it, I'm like, wow, that's like that's quite a that's a thing. That's a vibe. Just like singing with yourself. Uh, of, you know, who was that guy? Yeah, what that's was crazy. He, what was he thinking about? You know, was he feeling the same way I do now? It's it was it was a bit of a an exercise, and you know, it was a bit of an existential exercise. It sounds pretty rewarding, though. That level of almost I don't know. Would you call it catharsis? Yeah, yeah, I think you might be right. Like, like I got to finish these un these ideas that like yeah. were thrown around, and it's like, hey, hey, old me, pat you know, pick you up, pat you on the back. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So I felt like there's a little bit of that going on for sure. And so now learning the songs, just to answer your question, um, has been has been a little bit of that too, of just you know being like, do we even have that keyboard sound anymore? And like, how do we? How did we pull this off when we were recording this? What were we thinking? And so, yeah, it's, it's been great, though. That song's really fun for us to play live. Are there original pieces in, in all of those songs? Or were, was there anything that you just took ideas and had to, f- like, that are fully fleshed out and recreated? Or is there little bits and pieces? In... Um, sorry, what was that? Sorry, I missed you. My, my headphones cut out. Is there, like, is there bits and pieces of all the original recordings in these songs? Or were there some songs that you just flat out re-recorded start to finish? Um, so five of them are completely the original versions. Like they were mastered when we like recorded them by their, at some point in the last 10 years. Um, and then five of them were, were, were like kind of half to three quarters finished, but yeah. So the the newer additions to those five songs is, 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 is definitely like, you know, a quarter or 50% of the material. So there's a mostly old stuff. Sweet. And I always want like, do you worry about, like, is everything cleared out of the vault? Like, you see bands that come up with something Hell for 20th no. anniversaries, Hell 30th no. anniversaries. You, there's still more Hell to come, no. right? Yeah. Oh, there's so much more. <laughs> I can't there's imagine so how the size, the the memory that more. Royal Canoe Sessions or ideas have taken um, up over the years. Yeah, and, and because there's, you know, like any band, I feel like you just, there's so much throwing shit against the wall that goes on. Like, you just if you're not doing that and failing and like watching it slowly drip down the wall and like pool on the ground and kicking it out the window because you hate it so much. If you're not doing that, you're not doing it right. In my opinion, because you're going to, you're going to fail. And then by failing, you're going to learn something. And, you know, every once in a while you can sort of, you know, claw your way in the muck and find something from that pile that you really liked. But, uh, yeah, there's so much stuff. And I mean, loads and loads, as much as I was just joking about all the crap that we, that we've made, there's also a lot of things in that pile that like, if we had like two or three or four or five vaults, we could, we could come up with like, you know, so many little bits, like we call them shit bits. So I don't know if this is a family <laughs> program, but uh, certainly not. yeah. And so we, uh, that's been our uh, term of endearment for our little, our little, like just coming up with like a 30 second or minute long idea just quickly trying to throw something against the wall see what you get and so we have just hundreds of those things in the in the vault and you know some of the the newer songs are actually from that as well so here we go see royal canoe patreon coming coming soon hundreds full, and hundreds yeah. of vault. shit bits yeah hundreds of shit bits <laughs> yeah. shit bits to the... hundreds of shit bits yeah 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 that's oh my god the vault shit bits edition <laughs> two <laughs> Way to sell it. Way to sell it. <laughs> no, I don't mean shit bits. They're just ideas that I couldn't give all the attention they deserved yeah. at the time. It's a term of endearment. <laughs> Trust me. Um, so I, I'm really excited for April 15th because I've never actually had a chance to pl- uh, see you guys play. Um, so I'm very excited to see what you guys have set up on stage. I am. I do want to, and I don't know much about gear myself, but for a band who seems to, to be very um, adventurous with not just the sounds you make, but the, the tools you use. Um, how, like, how much of a gearhead are you? Are you like constantly keeping up to date with industry news? Is, do you have a huge shopping list of things that you desperately want someday? I feel like I go in, in waves. Okay. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'll go through phases of, of just like being obsessed and spending all of my uh, excess money uh, what little there is on, on gear and, um, and sense. And, you know, I, I got into modular synthesis, uh, about a year and a half ago. And, you know, you can just, you could literally just dump your entire, uh, bank account into that specific thing for the rest of your life and, and not know how to make a noise 
<laughs> because it's so complicated. <laughs> but it's also it, it's it's really it's really fun, and I like nerding out and going there. And I feel like also with like doing a lot of mixing and production stuff, you kind of have to try to stay on top of things. Um, if because if you're not, then it's you know you want to be making cutting edge sounds and you want to be on the front side of that stuff. And and so I feel like I always feel guilty if I'm not doing enough of that. Um, but there's also just certain things I just don't care about, like guitars. Like I, I, I enjoy playing guitar. I enjoy making sounds with it. I, I also like bass is one of my favorite instruments, but just like, there's like a guitar nerd thing that like, isn't my vibe. Um, and then, but there's so many like nerd aspects to every part of music. That's totally, it's, it's, it's a really annoying too. Like all, almost all of it, you know, there's, <laughs> And so you got to, I constantly uh, have to just check how far down those rabbit holes I go because there's just like a, like a money pit waiting for you wherever you go. And, and you know, whether it's plugins, whether it's preamps, yeah. whether it's synthesizers, headphones, speakers, like it drums, like it just never stops. It's an industry, you know, providing musicians with these little, these little dream uh, funnels. And, and, you know, that is, it's such an enticing thing to be like, Oh, if I just get this, if I just have this one thing, <laughs> I'll be like, complete. I, I can't tell you how many times, like <laughs> in your head, you have that, like, as it, it's impossible to avoid it, that you're, 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 uh, it's not like you think, I don't think you're ever necessarily think it's over, but I think you feel like this is going to have the thing that I've been missing, you know, like, and it never does. And or maybe it does for one thing, but I then you move on. And I feel like I've I've learned that too, that like you can't ever expect one thing to solve all of your musical problems. You know, you you have to see it as like like there's only a set number, like there's literally a number of times you'll be able to use something in yeah. your life. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's so so don't try to make this new instrument or gear piece that you have do everything. Just let it be the thing that it is and enjoy it for that and then and then maybe move on and sell it and don't be don't feel bashful with that so on the flip side of that what's the oldest piece of gear that you use that you could ima never imagine not having in the band Ooh, i think okay I, i'd say that there's two pieces of gear i can't imagine not having in the band i, if, I don't know if you can see that red headstock yep. to like right there mm -hmm. yep that base um, so that's called, and now it's the red base, but originally before all of our gear got stolen in 2016, it was the blue base. And, uh, that was, and the new version too, they were both just this, I don't know. It's like some instruments just kind of speak to you like that. That's like my desert Island instrument that like, I, I don't know if I grab a different bass, I'm like, What's, this is not right. And I've grabbed that instrument. It just all makes sense to me. And uh, it's such a huge part of our sound. And then right, I don't know, right next to it, you can't really see it, but behind this behind this uh, kibasa yeah. over here, uh, there's, a, there's a keyboard called the Poly 6. And that's also just been such a huge part of our sound. I, sound both of those are vintage instruments that um, we, these were, these are second versions of our original uh originals and uh but as far as the sound goes it really that really is like without those two things i feel like royal canoe would sound totally different so of all the gear of all the potential for you know the progress of musical tools <laughs> the two most important are, pian are keys and bass <laughs> keys and strings is that what you're saying easily yeah there we go no, no question back to basics well and and on yeah. that note <laughs> like because you know you know royal canoe songs are very elaborate and there's a lot of things going on where does it start does it start on keys? Does it start on guitar? Where does this, the, the, the the original idea come from? You know, it's always, this is such a, a scapegoat answer, but it is kind of always different. I, I will say one thing, it always starts on the computer. It always starts in our DAW. And so um, we use Pro Tools for uh, probably the better part of the first eight years, nine years of the band. And we, and we still do, um, but uh i think it wasn't eight years then anyway point is is that we started using ableton uh about five years back and that 
just shifting to that it sounds so basic like okay you, a daw digital uh audio workstation um you know it's where it's just like the tape machine it doesn't sound like it could make an, a big difference on the creative side but it's so different to use ableton um just the way that you can sample and repitch things and re change the tempo and all the instruments that just come built into it it's such a creative tool that like i would say since we started using it about five years ago that is where everything starts in ableton um but you know it's often it's a beat or it's or it's like a vibe like a soundscape it could be like a loop it could be um like the very um the last song on fault was the first thing that i ever made in ableton okay. so i downloaded like this hacked version of ableton um and uh don't hack your software. If like. <laughs> yeah, no crack software on no, uh, the road. The stage. I'm not promoting that, but uh, it, it hypothetically, let's say I did that in 2016. <laughs> uh, uh, that I so I got Ableton, and um, I was uh, I was like trying to figure out how to use it, and that song is called Message, and it's me figuring out. It's really just that song is me figuring out how to use this new DAW, and I sampled. Um, I sampled this piano part and um, and just kind of build something from there. And yeah, it's just a uh, it's a it's a it's a wonderful creative tool that is so different from what we used to use. And just that really has always excited me too. Of just being like, okay, I've seen everything through this lens, and that's revealed this much of what's possible to me. Now I'm going to see things through this lens, and I'm going to see this part of the the frame. Um, and I want to keep the challenge. I think as you get older, especially, is to is to keep is to keep uh, educating yourself and pre- keep shaking up your process, and never getting too stuck on one thing and never getting comfortable. Because I don't think you'd make good art when you're comfortable. Mm-hmm. I don't think you make good art when you're when you're uh, too confident either. Mm-hmm. Like you need there needs to be things. You need to be confident. You need to have ego, sure, but like. Feel like you, there also needs to be something at stake there needs to be an element of danger and you need to feel like there's a, a high potential for everything to crumble in your hands and and just go disastrously um and, and so uh yeah i i i, I think like learning a new I le- learning a new dog was was my attempt to and our attempt as a band to try to try to bring some of that back into the process we, uh, like we mentioned earlier, we had Jess from Sweet Alibi, yeah. Jess Air, on the show a couple months back, and uh, nice. you, you produced the Sweet Alibi record, right? The Dead Men is yeah. that that? Uh, yeah. yeah, Matt and I have uh, the other Matt in Shell- uh, Schellenberg. Matt Schellenberg. Yeah, 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 Schellenberg. So uh, he and I have a production duo called Dead Men. Yeah, and we produced the Sweet Alibi album, which was a lot of fun to work on. And it sounds amazing. People sounds great. And based on what Jess said, it it sounded like just a, a great experience that. Uh, Seems like uh, the way she put it, they kind of gave you the opportunity to move in more of a DIY uh, direction for production. Is that that that? Yeah, yeah fair it, to say? you know what I would say is that like we, it was I, I felt like in some ways it was going back to just like being in a room with a band because mm-hmm. um, I've 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 done some of those records and it's so much fun. And then for the last couple years, it's been more like working in primarily primarily in like the studio vibe and not necessarily being as much like band in a room what are we going to do and so this was a lot more like that like we were all sort of in there together and like you know figuring out the kick pattern or deciding on the guitar parts and and it was fun yeah really fun to get our hands in there and uh and you know they're all so talented and Mm -hmm. the songwriting that they brought to the table was incredible so it was it was just a matter of you know getting creative and and just figuring out how we wanted to dress up the songs and am i remembering it right did just say some of that album was recorded in her house yeah like weren't you like it incorporating was furnace yeah. or so, yeah, air no, conditioning I remember, that's sounds a, or the furnace noise that's right I yeah that. oh the furnace <laughs> yeah yeah we had we did like a bunch of pre-pro in our practice space our old practice space and uh and then we we did like about half of the we did like the drums and maybe some of the guitars and bass just like the bed tracks the first kind of stage of bed tracks in the studio and then 
we just figured we could make just as you know good decisions and the with the gear that we have we could we could definitely like afford a little more time if we just went into jess's basement and Mm so we set up down there and we worked for a couple weeks and it was yeah it was really fun doing that doing taking that approach so when you you get asked to produce this record for a group that you know is very talented and they're they're going to bring some great product creative product to the table um you two the the two mats the dead men are are producers slash musicians from a specific brand like where's the where's the creative line in what you feel you're expected to bring to the table musically not just on on the production level um i don't know if there is one to be honest like i think that you're you don't really you don't really set those boundaries i don't think beforehand like maybe some things get un- are unspoken or you discover boundaries as you go but i feel like the artists that are the most enjoyable to work with and the i think the producers are the best at it too like i I feel like you gotta everything is on the table and you deal with suggestions like i've worked with producers who have been the same way you know they'll suggest things about the lyrics they'll suggest things about the tones the chords the melodies everything and it's all it's all up for for debate um and i feel like yeah everyone in that project in sued alibi was so easy to to work with and i feel like we had a great kind of uh language of creativity and and collaboration going on and so yeah there i don't really think there are boundaries so to speak and i honestly in every project that i've done whether i'm producing or not producing that stuff isn't really isn't yeah there i don't really feel like that's ever been a thing um i have to ask about this because i had a moment like probably eight years ago but you guys toured with alt j right yeah um was it were you on the road with them for a while we we played like maybe a half dozen shows okay with them. so you, you've seen them Something like that seen them a number of times but i, I had this moment where i because i was really into that first single that they put out i was working for x929 in calgary and I forget what song it was, that Breeze Blocks or something. Tessellate, maybe? Tessellate, yeah, okay. Tessellate or Breeze Blocks, something like that. And um, yeah. I remember the KXP put out an Alt-J session, and I had never seen what they looked like before. And I'm watching it, and my partner comes in, and she's like, oh, they're a bunch of nerds. So I was like, yes, they're a bunch <laughs> of amazing nerds making beautiful music. And to this day, I think they're still really pushing innovation in, in terms of music. Um, totally. Did you learn anything or, or did any part of their performance, their, their, uh, live shows inspire what Royal Canoe does? I think you're always going to be informed by the bands that you play with and like, you see things that they do. Uh, and like, even just on the technical side, where yeah. you're like, how are they pulling that off? And, uh, and I think you're, you're, you're constantly, you know, after when you, maybe you're setting up before them and they're bringing their stuff on stage and you're looking and then you're, you know, you're asking about what they do. And so I feel like on the technical side, you're always wanting to know how other people are doing it. But then on the musical side, I I always thought it was amazing. Like this is such a small thing, but like, uh, the drummer Tom doesn't really use symbols and, uh, I've always just absolutely loved that. Like there's just not like big crashes and rides everywhere. It's, it's so tight and compact. And so I think tight, like, yeah. yeah, I just, I, I've always, that was such a revelation that like, Oh, right. Like just cause it's a drum set, like, and that goes for anything just, but just because it's a drum set doesn't mean it has to be a specific kind of drum set, you know, like there's, it, there are again, like going back to that, that same old thing, like there just aren't rules and you get it in your head that like, oh, this is the way that people have done things. And so we need to do it this way. And then you will see people like Al J doing it, you know, just taking their own spin and, and saying, fuck it to the, to the, the way that it was done, you know, for even something small, like using symbols. And you realize that, that you don't need to necessarily, if, if you want to try something different, just do it. Mm-hmm. And that's often why, like, you know, 18 and 19 and 20 year olds make some of the coolest music and, and push the most innovation and change because they'll be like, Oh yeah. I mean, maybe in the case of drums, they'd be like, Oh, we just couldn't afford a symbol. So we just didn't use one Yeah. or like, Oh, I couldn't like, I I just didn't have an an E string on my guitar. So I'm doing everything on the, you know, the uh, higher strengths just because I just didn't get one. And that's just why I made these choices. And so like, 
those obstacles um, and those things that seem like impediments often can be the can be like the inspiration and the source for for your innovative ideas and without even realizing it you're like oh i'm doing this just because because i had no other choice i yeah. always felt that's just such amazing no it's uh i i really appreciate yeah. both royal canoe and alt j's music for being incredibly te- what's up appears to me sounds to be technically proficient um with i don't know like sometimes i listen to you guys i just don't know what the fuck is going on are you holding back from using the word nerdy is that you don't know because i have no problem using that word because music nerds are the best i got no yeah yeah love that word music nerds are the coolest nerds yeah fight fight me marvel fans it's at least what we tell ourselves (laughs) um i wanted to ask too about your your show because you guys played in kiev right yeah what was that what was the basis of that show that was wasn't just part of a euro tour was it no uh it, it was on a euro tour right but it was a completely separate it's like a one-off right yeah it was it was interesting it was it was two shows um it was a um we got brought there by actually by the canadian consulate there wow. who was doing a canada 150 okay. celebration uh and that was sort of like the that was that was the reason that we were able to go um and so we were playing at like this world UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, for a Canada celebrate. You know, just people Canadians in the in the country and in the city. And, we we got to um, send our best. You know, send our best to yeah. represent. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so we were playing that, and then also as a um, to justify going there, like there was also this opportunity to play this really awesome festival. Um, and so we got to play uh, in this large park in the middle of Kiev. There is like a huge festival. Like imagine like their version of like Lollapalooza yeah. kind of thing with like a, an assortment of, you know, North American, British, Ukrainian, European bands from everywhere. And uh, yeah, the whole experience was incredible. And we absolutely loved you know, We were only there for maybe like three or four days, but it was uh, it was a really special trip, and now with everything going on, uh, yeah, I saw such a small glimpse into mm-hmm. it and got to experience such a small part of it. So I don't want to be one of those people who now suddenly I'm an expert on all things Ukrainian, but I feel like just being there and and having a sense of like even for the short period of time that there was there was like this tension between this either Ukrainian identity the Russian identity, how intertwined they were. And uh, I wouldn't say necessarily like, oh, I can see there was trouble coming, but you just got a sense of how much uh, of just what was there, that there was tension. And, uh, but like people figured it out and everyone there just, it was just such a, it was just such a great time for us. And so now to look back and, and see what's, uh, what's happening is just really heartbreaking. Yeah, and I'm sure you guys gained a ton of Ukrainian fans over those three, four days, right? Like a ton. Yeah, totally. It was, it was like, yeah, it was, it was amazing. And so now, now just to see that is just, uh, it's just, it really breaks my heart. And I, you know, obviously, it, it's, it's, it's such a, it seems like such a preventable thing, and it's such a tragedy, and it makes you really angry just to, just to think about it. That is true. Yes. That is true. So we'll move on to uh, happier, <laughs> happier things. I suppose is probably a good idea, Pete. Uh, I always like to ask a, a question. Yeah, COVID. <laughs> inflation. <laughs> uh, I'll try my best to keep it light. I usually like to ask a question, especially with you in the production world, uh, asking uh, what's the most unique instrument you've ever brought into a recording or wanted to use. I'm going to answer the question for you, though. And say that it's an instrument made of ice, which is, I think, one of the most fantastic things I have ever seen. That, that wasn't guys... in the studio, though. <laughs> Not in the studio, but... Well... Was well, it? Well, actually, the, the, well, in some ways, it was, because that, uh, we... So we started out that whole ice show, that whole glacial show. Um, which can be watched by just online. Expe- Wait, you guys watched it? Okay, great. Yeah, we, we started that out by... Um, by like bringing these ice pieces into Bucky's garage and just experimenting like with like how pitched can we make this? Like how much variance is there? How do you sharpen a note? How do you, how do you flatten a note? Just 
you know, we had, there was a, to be totally honest, the person that did all of the ice cutting is this guy named Luca uh, Roncaroni, I believe is his last name. And he's from, he's from kind of the, he's the creative director of the Swedish uh, ice hotel. And so he's kind of the ice, ice master guru. And he had worked with another musician in the past who had been doing similar things. And so we had this precedent of like, okay, so it is actually quite possible to be able to make, uh, to be able to make consistent pitches with ice. It, it, and, and, and cause if that guy hadn't been doing it, we would have had no idea. Um, but then we got to get creative and decide like, okay, can we make like a kick drum? Can we make a, we knew we could make like a xylophone, but like what else is there? And so we really just spent five, I don't know, like maybe like 10 hours or something in Bucky's garage, just playing with these pitched instruments <laughs> and uh, making like sample libraries as well with things that we could, we could tweak. And uh, yeah, in the end we had, um, we, we, we took that stuff then back into the studio we practiced with it into our space with the idea that in two weeks or three weeks, we're then going to have the actual ice instruments, but we will have sort of recreated our, our album already by working with these sampled versions. And then, um, yeah. So then, and then we were able to make like an ice base that was just sampled, but it still came from the ice. And we made like ice keys that Matt could play from these sampled um, sounds as well. And so, yeah, it, the, the final show was there was a lot of us playing on real ice instruments live that were mic'd, and that was obviously happening in real time. But everything else that we were playing from the kick drum to the bass to the keys, those were all instruments that we had recorded and manipulated from that original ice session. There you go. Isn't that un- Crazy. That's unbelievable. Crazy. And I highly encourage anybody who's never watched the clips of that show to go and check it out. It's one of the most amazing things. Especially if you have family or friends out of Canada, just send that to them and, and <laughs> tell them that's how we do concerts here. This we, is how we roll. We, yeah. live, we live in igloos <laughs> and we play on ice instruments. <laughs> and you know, to be honest, like getting, it would be, it was such a, we're so lucky that we actually got to pull that off because it was, I think three months before uh, COVID yeah. kind of yeah. hit heavy. Um, it was January 2020, that, I think. Yeah, yeah Jan yeah, 2020. Yeah. And our, our hope is that we get to do that again at some point in uh, in the future, at any point in our lives. If we, you know, if someone comes along and says, you know, we live in a super cold city and we want to have a nice show. Well, you know, we're ready. <laughs> there we go. There we we'll go. Bring our ice picks. Yeah, just follow in the, the, instead of like what the White Stripes play, being the first band to play every province and territory, Royal mm-hmm. Canoe can do be the first band to play every province and territory on ice on ice on yeah. ice instruments yeah put it on every ice. lake in canada <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna take a long time <laughs> yeah it's true um any any other things that you're you're excited about these days i mean you've got a lot going on and we've we've touched on most of it but anything new yeah i mean just to be honest like this tour is kind of taken up all of our energy right now because it's 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 weird to go back out there and way I like to think about it is, you know, you are what you do in a lot of ways. And so if you think you're a songwriter, but you don't write songs, then you're not a songwriter, Mm -hmm. you know? And if you think you're a live musician, but you don't play live, then you're not a live musician. And so there's a point where I feel like I'm not the person who goes on stage and sings songs and plays keyboards and, you know, hits ice instruments anymore because I haven't done that in two and a half years. And so now I have to like take on this new identity in some ways and become that new, become that person. And, uh, it's weird because I'm, I'm the person who sits around and, you know, maybe works on production stuff here, but also watches Netflix. And I just wasn't as much that guy two and a half years ago. So now I have to, and I feel like everyone's struggling with that in some ways to the, 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 the pre-pandemic person versus the the I don't want to say post-pandemic by any means, but like the person you are now. And so I think I'm excited. The thing I'm excited for is to is to sort of reintroduce, get reintroduced to to myself in some ways through this live show and being around these people that I love dearly, and you know, 
doing all the stupid shit we do in the van and and just getting to travel and meet people and see friends again for the first time in a long time so that's just really kind of getting me really pumped so only uh about a week away so yeah it's crazy yeah. i know the crew at bows are very excited to have you guys back in town and yeah. uh, we're looking forward we to love it playing too. there it's gonna be great right on pete you got anything else no that's amazing i just i I loved how you summed that up there at the end i just i like i feel so excited for you to get back out there and, and get going and i bet you you're probably you'll be in the van for 15 minutes and it'll just be like old times right yeah we'll be hating each other <laughs> immediately <laughs> uh It'll all be right all right well safe travels and uh we'll see you on a- april 15th dude see you guys then thanks right, man thanks peace Matt. bye All that brilliance. <laughs> there was that was sheer brilliance. Um, We're gonna look sheer, like Einstein's. That was sheer brilliance. He says after we wrap up our interview. <laughs> the, the inner workings of the road, the stage. So we just good. constantly. It's just a, a constant circle jerk of ego and build yourself up a little yeah, bit, right? Yeah. A little confidence boost. Super uber confidence. Uh, well, it's hard to feel like when you talk to a guy like Matt. Mm-hmm. Uh, who's like it, so? You'll have to go and watch. You did not watch the video of that ice. The Red Deer specific video? No, no, the ice, that ice concert. Yes, uh, no, I've seen it. Yeah, you yeah. have seen it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Like, and did you watch the making of? Like, no, I did not see the. No, I didn't see that. Out? Like, oh. No, it looked like quite a quite a uh, project. Very, very big project. Yeah, these guys, and like we said, these guys are nerds of the best kind. Hundred yeah. percent. All right, I stand by that. I love a good old music nerd <laughs> or an entire band of them. And they uh, come through Red Deer on April fifteenth, and you said you have not seen them before no and i can't i can't wait for the show too because zune zune is yes. opening right so dan monkman who was uh on an episode a few weeks ago right, episode 47 something like that 47, I, I give up i give up <laughs> i give up um so yeah royal canoe one of the many shows to look forward to here in red deer um we had altamita on friday night at bows which is fantastic as well uh, braids, unfortunately, Stiney knows had to cancel. I mean, there's just so much going on. And there's more coming. And uh, big announcements like uh, like the Sheepdogs Dude, got announced for November. Have you seen the Sheepdogs before? I have, yes. At Bose? Uh, not at this will be, if I'm not mistaken, Ryan, this is the first Sheepdog show at Bose. Yeah, God they played damn. the. Um, we got to see Jimmy Boskill on the on the yeah. stage at Bose. They played Westerner Days here at the Centrium. So they were in the arena a few years back. I forget. How yeah, I didn't see that. And then what would they, they played here with Monster Truck way, way back in the day, a venue downtown, but I can't remember what the hell. International Beer House. It wasn't the Beer House. B-I-B-H. Huh. Crazy. Well, that's that's very exciting. I'm so glad to hear that that's their first time at Bose. That's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be huge. And then, we might, like, are you going to buy your tickets? I'll get tickets. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. There, right. Have you seen Sheep Dogs? No. Oh, yeah. No. Well, Bose Skills. Like a great jam band. Like yeah. they are just... It yeah. was a fun night. Cool. We'll have to. What are they, they were? No, they were talking about their uh, day of the show meals, right? They do. They like to try to do. Oh, a that's big, right. They do a, a big nice group. group meal. That's right. And they are really fast at rolling joints. Yeah, that's true. We'll we'll have a competition. <laughs> we don't have to do that. Um, all right. Well, thanks to our friends that will also be joining us at all of those shows. I can only imagine at Bose Barn Stage, uh, Sawback Brewing Co. Go Services, Inc. And Ryan and Riley here at Communal Creative Studios. If you haven't uh, subscribed to the YouTube channel by now, I can only imagine you're some sort of Luddite. It's funny. You'll, like, if you hit, you'll get a subscription when a new episode comes out. And, a notification. Like, or, sorry, a notification. Yeah. When this, when... And if that's the sort of thing that annoys you, you can turn off that notification and still be subscribed while doesn't, still supporting Communal Creative Studios. It doesn't have to be a push notification. It nope. can just be a, you open your YouTube app and there's a little bell with a number on a it. Hey, number. what is yeah, that? Yeah. Hey, they've got a new episode. Cool, I'm going to watch it. When does that happen? like it when and it share happen? it When does it Wednesdays. happen? The Road the Stage is produced by Ryan Cooley and Riley Sir Yin at the Communal Creative Studios in Red Deer, Alberta. In partnership with Go Services Inc., Sawback Brewing Co., Tourism Red Deer, and Bose Bar and Stage.